Hi, my name is Carolia from the Yoga Lunchbox, and today I have with me Peter Fernando, who is, I have to say, is a close friend of mine. I've known him for a long time, but he is also a very accomplished meditation teacher and meditator, and he's recently written a book um, about many things, as I've discovered reading it, but the title is Finding Freedom in Illness, a guide to cultivating deep well-being through mindfulness and self-compassion. And in the book, Peter shares his journey um, through chronic illness and through his years. He spent seven years as a monk in, um, in the States, actually, but in the Thai forest tradition. So, Peter, welcome. Hi. It's so nice to have you on here. It's wonderful <laughs> to be here. And to be holding your book that you never really told me you were writing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I was, I was kind of low-key about it because... Uh, um, yeah, because of the energy limitations. I just mm. wanted to just make sure I'd actually written it first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. So let's, let's talk about those energy limitations. Because even like you and I have been friends for uh, seven or eight years now, and mm. I know that you have issues with health, but I don't think I've ever fully grasped what those issues have been or what it's meant for you. And I'm beginning to get a clearer sense reading the book. Mm. So how do you describe your health to people when they say, you know, what, what's going on with your health, dude? <laughs> <laughs> it depends who asks. Yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, in, in this, this context, I would describe it as uh, very, very limited energy generally mm. um, with – that that kind of comes out of nowhere and doesn't as yet seem to be related to any um, specific either quality of mind or condition of on the physical level. It's just this phenomenon and it's been going on for about 18 years. Uh, and it's it's hard to describe when, you know, when you say limited energy, it's like, oh, well, just go for a run, do some yoga, you'll be sweet, you know. But it's... It's it's of a different nature. I mean, and it very much corresponds with ME um, symptoms, which is um, kind of the the feeling is not like I'm I'm just a little bit tired. It's like uh, just for no reason you can wake up and feel like you've just run run a full marathon, and and you've got that much energy left to to then begin the day. Mm. Uh, so that's that's one way of describing it. Uh, so it's pretty full on. You know, I I generally don't kind of, um, you know, I don't make that, that big a feature, but um, from a subjective perspective, it's, uh, it's really challenging, you know. Mm. Yeah. Well, especially I imagine that, you know, you would have been to see many health professionals over the years. Mm. And not necessarily having a so-called diagnosis or any kind of you know particular treatment that may make any difference. Or mm. I imagine living in that unknown as well as living with this experience must add another layer to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly, particularly the first ten years because there was a real. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> the first ten years were really <laughs> tough. <laughs> Because it was a real challenge to the part of the mind that wanted to know things for sure and, and fix them and figure them out and just the very linear part of the mind, obviously, that, you know, I want to know what this is, I want to know how to fix it, could you help me get rid of it, please, mm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, and and yet, you know, so there was a, a huge journey seeing about, in total, about 24 different <laughs> Um, health professionals in different modalities Most, mostly like out of that 24 most were alternative practitioners after I'd already gone through the, the medical system mm. so Tibetan medicine Chinese medicine, chiropractic you know everything basically and it's, it's not to say that it, it didn't help so I'm actually way better mm -hmm. So if you, if you talk to um, the people I lived with when I was a monk, it's like now it's, it's a kind of completely different realm, really. Mm. Uh, but but there's a, you know there's just an underlying uh, illness in the body that as yet doesn't doesn't seem to shift. Um, 
but yeah, the the so the journey has been relating to that, but how mm. how the heart is with that, how and and how to use that in as best a possible way for my aspiration for for freedom and waking up and and an open heart. Mm-hmm. Because when you talk about um, finding freedom in illness, what you're talking about is not the sense that it can be fixed or healed. You know, it's just about finding the right magical formula there. Mm. It's more that you've actually used your illness as a way to turn inward and to move toward, I mean, I don't want to use the word enlightenment per se, but in essence that's what you're doing, isn't it? It's moving toward freedom from the conditioning of the mind. Mm. Yeah, that's the orientation. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say that I've arrived anywhere, but that's yeah. definitely the orientation. Yeah. And yeah, it's, and it, you know, and it's also not to say that, um, as it's, pro- it's hopefully obvious that it's not to say that illness shouldn't be healed and that we shouldn't try and get better mm. as much as we can. Mm-hmm. But it's, I guess it's aimed specifically for people who are living within the difficulties at a, you know, either um, for a long time or for a for a certain period of time, mm. and it's like rather than living in a state of continually judging oneself and wishing it wasn't here, and comparing oneself to how one thinks it should be, there's actually a different way of being with it, mm-hmm. and and so that's that's what it explores. I love how you start your book with "You're not wrong for being ill." And that's a, that's the first chapter, and it feels to me like instantly you kind of pop the bubble of this whole new age positive thinking affirmations concept. <laughs> that you know, if if we're if we're sick, then there's something we can do. You know, there's something we can do on the internal level that will fix us. Mm. And I love how you talk about this because it feels like it needs to be said. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's. Uh... It's been a real fascinating paradigm to explore for me personally, mm. and it's it's a real interesting one. And you know, it's it's not that there isn't truth in it, mm-hmm. and I guess my interest is is exploring it on a subjective level. What happens when that's clung to as an absolute mm. in the heart and the mind? What hap- What actually are the results? And for myself, the results are limitation as opposed to freedom mm. on on the level of heart. Um, and and it can be very tempting, and it, it is something that I've witnessed in myself, and and definitely in our culture and and with others. This uh, it seems to be around the assumption that um, success in spirituality means success in control. Mm. <laughs> Whereas, yeah, <laughs> you know, actually, as as appealing as that might be, and yeah. as um, as familiar as that might be, because it's actually, you know, it's how our our society functions. Really, it's the kind of dominant discourse. Actually, mm. it's just filtered into spirituality. But if you look at um, his, historical teachings of really wise awaken beings there's something there's something different being said you know and and so my interest has been particularly in in buddhist teachings uh, the teachings of the buddha and and different buddhist schools and and you know it's it's actually the core emphasis of the heart teachings is about relinquishment of of that uh, the belief in the need to control mm. and and the and the um, the obsession with conditions being a certain way to define oneself. That's like the, the heart what is actually the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> we keep getting told that, you know, you just got to know what you desire, etc. And if you desire it, then therefore yeah. you should have it. And like, and like you say, there is a sense in spirituality that successful spirituality means knowing what you want, knowing what your purpose is, knowing what your desires are and making them happen. And that yeah. means you're successful. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> and you know the thing is, it's not, it's not that that's that it's not true on one level, which mm. is interesting because because mm. it's not like um, 
I'm definitely, I definitely wouldn't advocate a kind of apathy or resignation either. Mm. And, but that's, it's like that's one level of being, you know. That's, that's one dimension of life. But it's often taken as the heart of, of practice, of, of one's aspiration. But it's, it's actually, it's not where the actual uh, freedom of heart can be found. It's it's useful to make life more pleasant, <laughs> you know. And why not, you know? Yeah. If one can, but again, if that's clung to, then when you can't, then all of the shadow stuff comes up, mm. and all all of the the limitations of the view itself, um, you get you get all of that in your face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you were in the monastery and you were quite ill, yeah, like you were, it was it was difficult for you to even sit yes. to meditate, right? Yes, it was what at least traditionally. Up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? That was uh, that was a trip. Mm. It was it was really full on. Um, you know, I think I was very lucky that the community was. Uh, it wasn't a dogmatic kind of environment. People were mostly very compassionate and um, and supportive. So I did a lot of lying down meditation. Mm. And um, I guess um, I guess I could actually sit for at least an hour a day, generally. Mm-hmm. Um, but within the community, there was there was usually more than that involved. <laughs> so at least <laughs> at least one sit, you know. Well, maybe not every day, but at least once I'd be sort of slumped over, or you know, often the, the med- meditation slumped over on my face became a uh, quite a comfortable posture. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it, but I, don't, I kind of got used to it. It's like. Uh, uh. And what mind chatter came up when this was arising? Or were you okay with it? Were you just accepting that was how you were and it was all good? Uh, um, definitely not at the start. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was It was very confronting because at, at that time my, my identity was very much invested in being a Buddhist monk. And that, in my mind's eye, that looked a certain way. Mm. Buddhist monks did this and that and they looked like this and they were awesome at these things <laughs> you know and it's like hang on I can't even set up you know let alone a lot of other stuff so yeah it was a sort of a barrage of, of self-criticism in a in a tyranny around a self-image was was my first that was how it first manifested mm. just basically feeling uh, like either a fraud or a failure or being judged or, you know, all of all of that stuff came up in a really big way. And how did the people around you, like particularly your superiors, how did they work with you in that place? They were uh, pretty incredible, actually. They were amazing. Mm. And the... the the training I got around that was that basically I'm making all of it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it was very clear. It's like, dude, we actually love you. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you're slumped over or not. <laughs> exactly. And 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 so love love was the was the primary context. So I feel very grateful for that mm. because um, you know it sort of seeped in after. After a while, after after things began to get really difficult, after mm-hmm. a couple of years, the the love I began to trust that actually, and and then find, be interested in finding that in my own heart for myself. Mm. So yeah, I feel very grateful. So was it like that love was sort of experienced initially as the container with which you were being held, and through yeah. being held in the container, you were able to find your way to the internal love. Yes. Well mm. said. Interesting. <laughs> Cause yeah, it, cause, that's it. Yeah, because someone asked me in a meditation class the other day, because as they were meditating, they'd started to notice like so much negativity coming up in terms of how they saw themselves. 
mm. and they asked about it and I you know and I just said from my understanding western westerners in particular mm. have so much you know self love is not a given it's not the way that no. we arrive for whatever reason no. and they were just like why is that why is that you know yeah yeah and um I, I didn't have an answer for that of course no neither no. But, but it is it's the, it's the case for most of us you know yeah we start to delve in and all of a sudden it's like the judge and the critic and uh -huh. there's very little actual real love for just the fact that we we're alive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. So in that seven year period then, by the time you left the monastery, you mm. would have been, I'm guessing, about your late 20s? Were you? uh, yeah, I was 30. 30, yeah. I just turned 30. And so had you come to a place of more peacefulness or calm or had some of those voices, those stories started to dissipate? Yeah. Yeah, it it was quite a significant shift mm. over that period. Um, it was that I mean that was one of the main uh, edges of practice that I was exploring in the context of both life in general, but also particularly in terms of the physical illness, was the uh, the quality of heart mm. with which which with which I was relating to pain and also the sense of self became the real crucial piece of starting to feel okay in the midst of everything mm. um, because that's like the the foundation I think the the sense of really trusting self-compassion and and a real warmth towards one's self sense mm. is it's like only from that place I find that I can then go a little bit deeper and then and explore what what it's like to not react to pain, for example, or uh, or move through days of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So if it's just sort of um, trying to harden up and get through it, that's not really sustainable in the long run. Mm -hmm. And and I find it really takes an openness of heart to to actually weather the more difficult mm. stuff on a really direct level. Yeah, this is really revolutionary, isn't it? Like just reflecting on our society, it's so it's such a different way to approach the conditions within which one finds oneself. Yeah, to totally. Like, you say to soften into and open into one's own heart and be mm. as compassionate and loving towards yourself doesn't mean you're not necessarily trying to change those conditions, you know, like you say, to make them more pleasant if that's possible. Mm. But just mm. that no matter what, there's that quality of heart coming through. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I love how in the book when, you talk, uh, when you're talking about difficult things, you talk, call them the dark emotions, not the negative, not the bad. Mm -hmm. You know, you call them the dark <laughs> emotions. And I love, in fact, I'm stealing that. I'm going <laughs> to use that. I promise to credit you when I can. <laughs> Um, because there's no, I mean, dark doesn't necessarily, you know, dark doesn't have a, um, a judgmental quality per se, mm. you know, we all yeah. know that there's the dark and the light and the two have to coexist. Mm. Um, so when you talk about the dark emotions, which emotions are you referring to or some, you know? Yeah. Well, I focused on fear and anger mm. primarily because they seemed, at least for me, and you know, it's only... Uh, it's all in relation to my own idiosyncratic cosmos, <laughs> so it could be way different for others. But and there are obviously others and and derivatives of that. But mm. for me, they they're really sort of base, primal expressions of of the uh, the the conditioned mind's response to difficulty. And and I guess there is a real. Um, uh, benefit and not calling them negative or bad mm. or, you know, or whatever, you know, the the unwanted stupid emotions that you should never have. <laughs> yeah, because that, that's the other thing that's going on right now, this whole sense of happiness all the time. Right. It's like, but 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 what about the fear? And Like I'm almost starting to want to like stand behind the fear and the anger and go, you know, they, they have a right to be heard as well. They have a mm -hmm. right to an existence. They, you know, they're messengers as such. Absolutely. Mm. Because they're because they're there, you know. If yeah. they're there, they're, <laughs> then they're there. Yeah. Um, and I guess the for myself, the interest has been both in 
in finding like what they call the middle way in Buddhist jargon, the the place where then it's not about repression, but it's also obviously not about indulging in the reality that they suggest either, because mm. that you know that's sort of the that's just business as usual, mm-hmm. and and it can lead to such intense states of suffering when you're sick, you know, because there's no way of of from the rational mind arguing with terror when it arises because mm. it's bloody scary. Yeah. yeah you, know? you, you talk in the book about one incident in particular where you would sometimes have panic attacks after a, an afternoon nap with yeah. the sense the mind would start projecting into the future and what your life is going to be like in 10 yeah. years' time, etc. Can you yeah. describe what happened with the terror? <laughs> mm-hmm. mm. Yeah, that... Uh, that was that was intense, and it was really. I think there was, a, you know, there's always there always has to be a ripeness to, to meet that stuff directly. So, the like as a caveat, I would say that it's not about trying to f- sort of force uh, intense feeling to happen, mm. and you kind of have to be, in the, either in the right space or have a foundation of of that quality of kindness and acceptance and self-compassion um but but sometimes it will just come up and you've got no choice so um that was kind of what happened really you know it was like all the defenses stopped working all the uh mm. the sort of meditative states that I could uh feel that I could sort of use to hold everything together and instead it was just like a yeah just a deep terror in the belly of you know holy hell <laughs> this is this is frightening mm. um and and so that that ha- kept happening for a while and and i found myself really getting caught in the apparent reality of the future and then I sort of over a period of weeks after that started happening, I sort of subconsciously or unconsciously created an identity around disaster. So I am this person who in the future will have this disastrous life. And that became, uh, I was invested in that in my mind as real. And then so there was one afternoon when, when the fear arose again in that vulnerable state. And there was just this sense of, at the same time, also seeing that the future that arose on top of it was secondary, was actually a construction. Mm. I was actually making that up. Mm -hmm. It was a process of fear, then clinging to the fear, looking for a self, creating the self in the future, then believing that. And so this particular afternoon that I that I talk about this this um, story, um, there was a sense of no, nah, I'm not gonna. I see the future creating itself, and what would it be like to just be here and be afraid? Ah. Instead, just be purely afraid, but without all of the extra stuff that closes the heart around it. And and actually, uh, you know, generates a hell of a lot of suffering around all of the the both the wrongness of the fear and the belief in me and my life and how terrible it is, all of that stuff. What if I don't do that and just be in the body and and create space around the fear and just feel fear as fear? Um, and that had a, a really paradoxical effect of of cooling and calming. Because mm. as, um, as I mentioned around that story, it's the fear of the fear that often is, is a real impediment mm. to giving ourselves space for, for that, that, that natural energy, because fear is, is natural, we all have it, uh, for it to move through, to give it space to flow through. Mm. Yeah. You know what I found so powerful about reading this book 
is that, I mean, you, obviously you've written it for people who, like you said, are experiencing chronic illness or who are having a period of illness in their life. Mm. And um, I'm not ill. Um, mm. And and yet I feel like reading it, that I'm reading the story of my life over the last 10 or 12 years. And mm. I'm actually wishing I had your book because I could have like jumped ahead a little bit faster. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. <laughs> I bet, because you, you describe, the conditions that you describe, the stories that come up, um, the subtleties and the nuances, they're identical to what I've been through in the last decade or so. And, you know, that terror you just describe and, like, letting go of the story, that happened, I had a similar thing happen to me yesterday, you know, or the day before, when I woke up with such intense dread in my belly. Wow. But this time I just went, you know what, it's just sensation. Yeah. It's just sensation. And I went about my day going, it's just sensation. And I just showed up and did what I needed to do and gave myself space. And it's just sensation, you know. And it shifted my whole, instead of the normal stories and, the, you know, all of the stuff, it was it's mm -hmm. just sensation. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to know why. I don't have to control it. I don't have to fix it. Just mm. sensation, mm. you know. Fantastic. Yeah. So when I read your book, like I, I feel like I'm going to be dipping in and out of it a lot, and <laughs> it speak it feels to me like it speaks to the universal journey of you know to the heart of freedom, really. Mm. Well, that's really cool. Mm. <laughs> so that, that's some feedback. So don't just re recommend it to people that are necessarily <laughs> ill. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, now, one last thing I want to talk about before we close, because in particular, this I think is something we can. So many of us can relate to. You talk about compulsive becoming, mm -hmm. and in particular, like when you left the monastery, like you left behind an identity as a monk, and mm -hmm. you were no one as such. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and how you just had to learn to sit with the desire to step into something. Mm -hmm. as such can you tell us what a little bit about what you noticed around that that sense of compulsive becoming mm -hmm. yeah that's a that's another one of these kind of very primal forces that that often also gets um kind of ca or can get co-opted into the spiritual journey uh, as a uh, as an unquestioned energy actually and and can often disguise itself as a uh, a servant of freedom. <laughs> so, but but more generally, it's I think it's again tied in with um, a, a bias in in our culture, but also just generally, I think, in the human heart that um, that I need to be able to quantify my value through a specific identity in order to feel uh, whole or to feel like like I'm worthy and for myself that's that's the root of the becoming energy is a as an assumption that I need to create myself into a thing and then uh, ascribe value to that thing in order to feel like I'm actually worth something. Mm. It's a very primal kind of bias. Yeah. So then what did it feel like when you decided not to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, scary, but, but really good at the same time. Mm. Really freeing. Because... Um, Again, it's not about taking a position against it because it has functions. Otherwise, you know, but both on a on a relative level, it, you know, it's it's good to feel you know satisfied in who we are and what we do, and a sense of identity around self respect and and doing things well and all of that. It's great, mm. but again, like there's a place where the heart can contract around that as the point, as the as where I'm actually going to find the refuge. And when we do that, then it's a rip-off. Mm, <laughs> so, yeah, so really, yeah, so when we're challenged, when we can't do it, when we can't feed on it, when there's nothing reflecting that back to us, if we're completely invested in it, then the only option is to suffer. But if, if we're 
interested in it as a as a dynamic as a an energy of mind and heart then the release from it feels really good feels like fresh air it's like a ah what a relief Mm. I don't have to be anybody in particular I'm Mm. just here you know (laughs) and I don't know who I am and I don't need to and it's a it's a, a lovely feeling Mm. Mm. Well, Peter, thank you so much for writing this book. <laughs> for, you know, like you say, it's an energy resource management thing for you in terms of yeah. I love the fact that you manage your energy well enough <laughs> to write this because it is, it is such a valuable resource and I think so many people are going to get enormous value from the nuances that you bring to things. It's just it's powerful. You're very kind mm. and thank you. Yeah, and thank you too for coming on the Yoga Lunchbox. Pleasure to have you. Always my great pleasure.